um, how the Lord might uh, lead you to give to that offering. So let's take a few minutes, stand up, and greet one another, shake hands, and say Happy Easter. Before we get started uh, with our time together, I wanted to read a passage for us, uh, pray over us, and then we're going to begin our worship time. Uh, our passage comes from 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 3. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's pray. Father, you are good and you are so faithful to us. And Father, your goodness and faithfulness uh, is culminated in the events that we celebrate this weekend. Father, the, the death and resurrection of your son that you gave for us as our substitute. And Father, we thank you for uh, the price that was paid on the cross for our sins, a price that we could not pay. And Father, I pray that this morning as we sing over one another, as we hear the, the choir lead us in worship as well, Father, I pray that we would have our heart and our mind transfixed on you. Our affections would be drawn to you. Uh, and Father, we would make much of your son Jesus this morning. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Happy Resurrection Day. Let's sing to the Lord this morning. Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left His throne to wake as a child He became like the least of us Behold Him Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion, oh, be still and behold Him. He who dined with sinners and the blind, the lost, and the lame, even now he is in our midst. Behold him, he who chose a criminal's hand, paid with blood to settle our debt, buried death as he rose to life. Behold him.
John 11, 25 through 26. Jesus says this, I am the way, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? That question is still valid for us today. Do we believe the words that we're singing, the songs that are sung? Have they changed the, tra the trajectory of our life in such a way that we aren't the same person we used to be? Let's continue in praise. There is now a hope that lasts beyond our day. For the one that once was buried lives again. Now the tomb is bare and empty and the stone is rolled away. Praise the risen one who overcame the grave. All you broken hearted, all you Born and we come find living water, everlasting streams to the wandering spirit, lost and searching, wanting something more. Find the risen King who overcomes the world. No more doubt and fear For our sin and shame They have no power here In His resurrection Perfect love has set the captives free Praise the risen King Who stands in victory let there be dancing in the darkness and let our song break through the night. Lift your voice and sing that Christ is King for Jesus is alive. Let there be dancing in the darkness and let our song break through the night. Lift your voice and sing that Christ undone hallelujah jesus has won hallelujah we overcome oh in jesus oh in jesus hallelujah death is undone hallelujah jesus has won hallelujah we overcome oh in Oh, in Jesus. 
thank you that we serve a risen Savior. That by your power and authority, you have, yes, risen your son, Jesus, but you also bring many from death to life because of his sacrifice. So, Lord, we pray that you would continue your business of bringing the, the dead to life, of bringing those that were in darkness into light today as we hear from your word. Encourage and challenge our hearts. So, let me pray. Amen. His arrival was noticed by wealthy and poor alike, though he would grow up in relative obscurity. You may not have noticed him had you passed him on the street, but he astounded the experts with his insight. He grew in wisdom and stature. He fed the poor, healed the sick, touched the untouchable, taught the experts, noticed the outcast, forgave the criminal, one life turned the world upside down. Betrayed by his own people, beaten and bruised, sentenced to a common criminal, and falsely accused, finally killed in the most painful way imaginable. He breathed his last breath, a breath of mercy for his killers, and while one life had mattered, it was finished. All was lost. But then, on the third day, love pierced through the darkness, and against all hope, the Savior of the world arose, crushing sin and death with glorious victory, throwing back the curtain of sin and conquering grave. Jesus the Christ had risen. Hallelujah! He is risen indeed. Today we join with believers around the world to celebrate the hope and promise found in our risen Savior. Let us sing as one. Praise the risen King.
Thank you, choir and praise band. Two Sundays now in a row, the choir has blessed us with a message and a song. Amen. We're thankful for Zach and all of them. Well, good morning, church. And uh, happy Easter to all of you. And so glad you're with us uh, this morning for uh, our Easter worship service. And uh, it's a little um, <clears throat> kind of taking me back having a 945 service. Of course, we used to do three services every Sunday morning. And, uh, and so this 945 is um, <clears throat> taking some getting used to uh, for this Sunday. But nonetheless, I'm glad that you're here. And um, listen, we are here to worship a risen Lord. Amen. And we are so thankful for what God has done in sending Jesus Christ to this earth to live a sinless life and then to die a sinner's death, but three days later rise again from the dead. And so we are here to worship Jesus. Well, if you have your Bible, let me invite you to pull it on out now and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 15 is where we're going to be at here this morning in our time in God's Word. Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> As you're turning there in your Bibles, um, I heard a story a while back about a, a woman who on uh, one particular Easter morning was on her way to church when her, her car broke down. And uh, not wanting to be late for this special service, she decided to call and order uh, an Uber to come and pick her up. And so the car arrived and she quickly jumped into the back of the car and about Halfway through the ride, she uh, wanted to ask the driver a question, and, uh, and so she spoke to the driver, uh, but he didn't respond. He didn't say anything, and so she kind of leaned forward and just kind of tapped him on the shoulder, and uh, when she did that, the driver let out a, large, a loud scream. Uh, he swerved into the other lane, almost hit another car, slammed on the brakes, and skidded off over onto the shoulder. And the woman and the driver just kind of sat there in the car, you know, startled for what felt like 30 minutes. But they sat there in, in shock over what had just happened. And finally, the woman broke the silence and she, she spoke kind of apologetically and said, Sir, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I had no idea that tapping you on your shoulder like that was going to alarm you, you know, like it did. And the driver said, well, ma'am, you know, really no need to apologize. You really didn't do anything wrong. It's just that this is my first day as, as a driver uh, for Uber. He said, you see, for the past 25 years, I've, I've been dri driving a hearse. <laughs> you see, a hearse carries, okay, just making sure. Um, <clears throat> but you know, it's not every day that a person comes back to life, is it? Uh, but of course, 2,000 years ago, that is exactly what Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, did. After being arrested, beaten, crucified, placed in a tomb, three days later on that glorious Sunday morning, up from the grave he arose. And in one glorious moment, having endured the cross, scorning its shame, Jesus came back from the dead, reigning victoriously over sin and death. And as a result, the Bible declares that for all those who put their faith and their hope in Jesus Christ, who trust in Him, that one day when we die, we too will defeat death, and that we will live forever with Him in heaven. In fact, John 14, verse 19, Jesus said, Because I live, you too will live. And in John chapter 11, He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in Me, even though he dies will live forever. It is the good news of the gospel, and it is news that is worth proclaiming and celebrating not only this day, but every day. Amen? That Jesus is alive. Well, on Easter Sunday, we typically spend some time discussing and, discussing and talking exclusively about the resurrection of Christ, because after all, that's what Easter is all about. But this morning, together, I want to do something a little different here today on this Easter morning. In fact, I want to share with you a short parable, a short story that Jesus once gave to a group of people. It is actually one of his more familiar parables uh, that is found in the Bible, and it's actually one of the most famous short stories in the entire world. It's a story of a, a son who rebels against his father. He runs off to, shall we say, Sin City, where he indulges in sin and wild living, and eventually his fun runs out, 
He reaches rock bottom and humbled, ashamed, embarrassed, broken inside, he decides to return home where he finds his, his father waiting on him. His father is waiting on him with open arms, welcoming, welcoming him back and forgiving him completely. It's an amazing, an amazing story, a familiar story to many of you. It is referred to as the story of the prodigal son. Now, some of you this morning are thinking, well, hold up, wait a minute there, Pastor. Like, this is Easter. Like, why are you not talking about the resurrection? Like, let's just, let's just talk about Jesus riding from, rising again from the dead. Why are we talking about the story of the prodigal son? Well, I hear you and everything, but you see, I believe that on this Easter Sunday, more than any other time of the year, I have seated before me possibly many people who I believe desperately need to hear the message of this story here. It's no secret that on Easter Sunday we have more people attend our services than usual. <laughs> In fact, on Easter Sunday, our overall attendance completely doubles. And listen, we're so thankful that each and every one of you are here this morning, okay? Regardless of who you are or where you came from, we're, we're thankful that you're with us. But the reality is, is I just can't help but think about how a good number of people who are here with us this day won't be here next Sunday. And that could be for a number of reasons, right? Like maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian to begin with and someone invited you to come and to be here and you thought, hey, why not? They've been asking me and asking me and asking me and so I might as well show up. And what better Sunday to go than Easter Sunday, right? So that's why I'm here. Or quite possibly some of you, you know, you're not a Christian, but you're curious as to this whole Easter thing and, and why Christians make a big fuss out of Easter every single year. And so you're just kind of here to see uh, what everyone is kind of talking about. Or maybe, just maybe, you're one here this morning, well, you grew up in the church. Might even possibly be a member of the church. That is, you are familiar with who Jesus is. You are familiar with what he has done and being a part of the family of God is familiar to you, but on most Sundays, truly being a part of the family of God is not necessarily a priority for you. And so every year, Easter for you perhaps has become kind of like that yearly check-in for you. Other things have quite possibly distracted you as being as faithful to the church as you know you should be or possibly even want to be. In fact, for some of you here this morning, the very fact that I am bringing this up is making you a little uncomfortable. <laughs> You're like, Pastor, like, I'm, like, I'm here to, to, to hear about the resurrection. You're starting to meddle a little bit. And um, so, hey, let's just, you know, talk about the resurrection. Let me go on my way. Let me go home and eat my Easter lunch, and I'll see you next year. But listen, I love you too much to do that to you. And I just think that there are some here today who need to be reminded of the heart of God who longs for you to be in right relationship with the church and more than that, to be in right relationship with Him. Because to be honest, your lack of involvement with the church is a great indicator of your lack of intimacy with the Father. The two are actually related. And so with all that being said, before we dive into this story, let me just kind of set it up for you just a little bit, okay? See, although this story here is often called and referred to as the prodigal son, the key figure in this story is actually not the father, or actually not the son. It's, it's the father. It's the dad in this story. In fact, in giving this story, Jesus is really teaching us and his audience that day what God's heart is like towards those who were lost and have rebelled, yet repent and return home. So Jesus gives his story and is essentially telling us that the God of the universe is like the Father in this story here. He's eager to forgive when repentance is made. And so because of that, this story really should be retitled, in my opinion, from the story of the prodigal son to the story of the wonderful Father. Again, he is the key figure of this story. And so to anyone here this morning who feels distant from God or far from God because of what you've done or who you've become. Well, listen to me. This story right here is for you, okay? And so if you look at your guide, your bulletin insert, there are three kind of movements to this story that we're going to look at. First thing I want you to look at is I want you to look at the rebellion of the son. The rebellion of the son. Look at verse 11. It says, and he said, so this is Jesus speaking. It says, and so Jesus said, there was a, a man, a father, who had two sons. And the younger of them, the youngest son, he said to his father, father, 
Give me the share of property that is coming to me. So he, that's the father, divided his property between them. Now pause right there. You need to know that for this this son to be saying what he is saying here to the father, you need to know it was a, a very cold and callous thing to say. Why is that? Well, because the son here is demanding his inheritance while the father is still alive. Of course, back then and even today, like you don't get your inheritance until when? Someone dies. And so most scholars and theologians believe that this son here is essentially telling the father, Dad, you're really dead to me anyways. Like, I don't really want anything to do with you. And so just give me my inheritance now, and and I'll be on my way. That's essentially what the son is saying to the father. More than likely, the son is tired of living underneath the father's authority. He's tired of all the rules. He's tired of all the restrictions. This guy just wants to go and be free. And so he tells the father, in essence, Dad, you're as good as dead to me. Just give me my inheritance so we can now part ways. And listen, personally, I can only imagine the pain and the anguish of one of my children, possibly one of my three boys, perhaps coming to me one day and telling me, you know what, Dad, I want nothing to do with you. I don't want a relationship with you. I don't want to be around you. I don't want my kids to be around you. And so just give me my inheritance and get out of my life. Nothing in my life would cause me more pain. But that is what the son is essentially communicating to the father in this story. Well, verse 13 says, Not many days later, the the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property and reckless living. Now, Jesus only uses six words here to describe what this son did. That is, squandered his property and reckless living. Although it's just six words, a lot can be read into those words, right? With a pocket full of money, he probably headed straight out to the slot machines, to the bars, to the strip, strip clubs. He takes everything he's been given, and he wastes it away on sinful self-indulgent. And listen to me. I'm sure as he did this, he had himself a grand time, okay? I'm sure he had a lot of fun. Why do I say that? It's because of what Hebrews chapter 11 tells us. Hebrews chapter 11 tells tells us that there is pleasure, fun, there is pleasure in sin. You know, I think it always shocks people when I read that verse and say things like sin is fun. But it is. Sin is fun. Sin is pleasurable. I mean, think about it. If sin wasn't so pleasurable or fun, it wouldn't be so tempting. In fact, if, if sin ain't fun to you, listen, you ain't doing it right, okay? Sin is fun. But listen, while sin is fun, Hebrews 11 finishes that verse and says that sin is pleasurable only for a season. A season. Don't miss that. Sin is fun, but eventually the fun comes to an end. And that's exactly what happens here to this son. Verse 14, it says, And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Listen, what a terrible situation the son finds himself in. All his money has run out. All his friends have all abandoned him. He finds himself in a pig pen, a pigsty, longing to eat the pig slop because he's essentially starving to death. Now, when Jesus added that detail of the son wallowing around in the pig pen, like you and I, we read that, and we're like, yeah, that's pretty disgusting, right? Like, that's, that's pretty nasty. But remember, to, to the Jews, uh, the, who would have been the primary audience that Jesus was speaking to, to the Jews, a pig was an animal that was ceremonially unclean. It was an unclean animal. And so for them to hear this and to hear that this Jewish boy was living with the pigs, longing to eat their food, this would have just completely blown their minds. Like I can imagine as Jesus is telling this story to this Jew- Jewish audience and he gets to this part where he's like, yeah, and the, and the Jewish boy was hanging out with the pigs. I can imagine you could have heard this audible gasp. <gasps> the pigs. But see, that's how bad things had gotten for this kid. This guy has hit rock bottom. But don't miss it. You see, this is an illustration. This is a picture that Jesus has given of the effects of sin. You see, sin starts out great. Sin is exciting. It's fun. 
But eventually the seasons change. Eventually this fun gives way to emptiness and pain and regret. See, sin's pleasure is only temporary. Many times just momentary. Yeah, there's a drunken party and the fun of hanging out with friends, but, but then there's the hangover. Yeah, there's the excitement of an affair, but then there's the divorce and the ruined family. Yeah, there's the fun at the bar and the drinking and the partying, but then comes the, the habit that grips you. Yeah, there's the sleeping around and all of that, but then comes the unwanted pregnancy and then the emotional baggage and scarring that you carry with you on into the future. You see, you need to know, friend, that there is pleasure in sin, but just for a season. It starts out fun, but then eventually ends in despair. Sin always leads to sorrow and sadness, always. Well, from the rebellion of the son, next I want you to see the, the repentance of the son. This is important, the repentance of the son. Look with me at verse 17. It says, but when he came to himself, you may want to underline that part right there. When he came to himself. Other translations say, when he came to his senses. I like that. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, here's his speech that he's going to give to his father. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And so he arose and came to his father. So here the son, after reaching rock bottom, it says that he comes to his senses and he decides to swallow something besides the pods that the pigs ate. He decides to swallow his pride. And in humility, he starts down that long road back to his father's house. Now, if you look closely here at this text, you're going to see three steps, actually, that this son took in returning to his father. Three steps, and these are important. Three steps, three things that took place for the son that need to take place in your life, if you're here this morning, finding yourself far from God, needing to return home. Number one, first of all, like the son, you too must come to your senses. Come to your senses. Like, you gotta, you got to come to a point, my friend, where you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Like, you have to get to a point where you realize, you know what, look at my life. Like, this isn't working anymore. What I've been doing, how I've been living, like, this ain't working out. I'm not the person that I want to be. I, I'm sick of my sin, and I hate my sin. you got to get to a point where you, like the sun, you come to your senses. But then secondly, listen, there also needs to be confession. Confession. You see, after the son realized the shame of the situation, the next thing that came out, came out of his mouth was this, I have sinned. That's what he says. I have sinned. He's admitting that he has sinned against God and his earthly father. And this is what the Bible calls confession. Now, you need to know that confession isn't notifying God what you've done. Okay, that's, that's not it. He, like, he already knows, all right? God, so, so he already knows what you're done, you've done. You're not telling him something that he doesn't already know. Confession is simply you agreeing with God that your behavior and your actions are wrong and sinful. So confession is just an honest admission. Father, I was wrong. God, I've messed up. God, I've sinned. And I'm sorry. That's confession. But then thirdly, not only do you need to come to your senses, confess your sins, but thirdly, listen to this, you need to change your direction. You need to change your direction. Check out what it says here about the son after he came to his sins and confessed his sins. It says, verse 20, it says, and he arose and came to his father. Don't miss this. He arose and came to his father. That is, he physically got up and returned home. You know what you call that? Repentance. Repentance. You see, repentance is, is, is more than just confession. Repentance is action. That's what repentance is. It's changing your direction. It's, just, it's not just feeling sorry over what you've been doing, but actually it's feeling sorry enough to stop. That's what repentance is. My friend, true repentance is not just admitting you are in the pig pen. 
True repentance is getting up and leaving the pig pen. Do you hear me? Repentance means changing your behavior. And so for things to be made right between you and the Lord, for you to be forgiven, God does not demand perfection from you. He doesn't. But He does demand and require repentance. In fact, do you remember the story of the woman as mentioned in John chapter 8, the woman who was caught in adultery? The Bible tells us that this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. She was brought to Jesus, and they're about to stone this woman for her sin. They're about to kill her. But Jesus said to them, he said, He who is without sin be the first one to cast a stone. And what happens? It says that all of them began to drop their stones, and they walked away. And in that moment, Jesus is just left with this woman. And remember what Jesus said to her? Je Jesus forgave her of her sin. But the last thing that he said to that woman was this. He said, you're forgiven, he said, but then he said this, but now go and sin no more. That is, you're forgiven, but you need to make a change. You need to live differently. You need to do things differently. There needs to be repentance in your life. So please know this. The Lord is quick to forgive, but He demands repentance. And so some of you here this morning, listen to me, you, in just in, in talking about this, reading this story, you are already, by way of the Spirit, you are convicted of your sin. You are tired of what you're doing. You know it's not right. And here this morning, you're having a pig pen moment. You are coming to your senses here this morning in this place. And quite possibly, you're already in the process of confessing these things to the Lord in great humility and brokenness of your sin. But my friend, please don't forget the last step. You need to repent. you got to repent. And at the end of the day, that's the big question. Are you willing to make a change in your life? Are you willing to turn away from your sins like the Son does here? Well, we've seen the rebellion of the Son. We've seen the repentance of the Son. But then lastly, I want us to see the restoration of the Son. The restoration of the Son. Verse 20, it says that while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, saw him coming home, and felt compassion. And it says, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, notice how the father receives the son here. He doesn't chastise the son. He doesn't beat him. Rather, he runs to his son, he wraps him in his arms, and, and he kisses him. Now, in the Greek, it's that word kiss there. It doesn't mean that he just gave him a peck on the cheek. No, no, no. And the, the verb actually ind indicates that he kissed his son and he just kept kissing him. You, we might say that he smothers his son in kisses here. Now, I want you to remember for a second where the son has been, okay? Like, like he's been hanging out with the pigs. He, he, there's probably a stench. He probably smells pretty foul. But the dad doesn't care, does he? No, I want you to know the father accepts the son here just as he was. Yeah, the father could have said, hey, glad you're home. Did you learn your lesson? Good. Now go get cleaned up. You're filthy. He could have said that. But no, the father instead loved him and accepted him just as he was. And I've got news for you. This is our God. This is our God. And you might be here today and you've drifted from the Lord. You've chosen to disobey the Lord and walk away from Him. But if you will come to your senses, confess your sins, and repent, our God doesn't care what you've done. He will accept you just as you are. See, the point is this. It's not about trying to clean yourself up before you come to God. That is not how it works. No, 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 no. It's about coming to Him just as you are. Shame, guilt, Sin, it's about coming to Him with all that baggage and allowing Him to clean you up. Now, notice something else is pretty important here. Notice that it says that the Father ran to meet His Son. Would you note that? He ran to meet His Son. It's an interesting you know, point there because, listen, back then in, in that culture, older men didn't typically run. <clears throat> Even today, you don't find a whole lot of older men uh, running these days, unless it's for sport or exercise perhaps, or they're trying to get away from something. But back then, for a man to run, what he would have to do is he would have to pull up his, his robe so that he wouldn't get tangled in it. He would pull up his robe, and in doing so, he would expose his legs. 
And so in that day, a, a man who exposed his legs was considered to be undignified, like, like a man of respect never would never do that, and therefore he would never run. But Jesus makes a point here in this story to say, no, 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 this father ran to his son. And what does that tell us here? Well, remember, this whole parable, this whole story is telling us something about who? It's telling us something about God. And did you know this? In all of the Bible, you will never find God running. Ever. Why is that? Because you never see God in a hurry. <laughs> God's never in a hurry. That's not God. Why? His timing is perfect. He's never in a rush. He's never panicked. The only time in Scripture where, where we read of God being depicted as being in a hurry is right here in this story, and I just love it. Question, when is the only time we see God in a hurry? It's when it comes to forgiving sins. God is eager, you might say, to forgive sinners when they repent. He's quick to forgive sins. Now, let me explain also exactly why he runs out to his son. One reason in the story here why the father runs out to the son is, is yes, he is eager to forgive him and love him. It's to show affection. That's easy to see here in the story. But I want to explain another reason, perhaps, why this father runs out to hug and meet his son like he does. That's probably not as, as obvious here. And that is, he runs out to meet this son, not just because of great affection for the son, but he actually runs out because of the son's protection. Like, he's got to protect this son. Why is that? Well, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18. Deuteronomy 21, 18, it states that if a man has a stubborn or rebellious son who will not obey the voice of the father or mother, then they are to lay hands on that son, bring him to the elders of the city of the gate, and all the men of the city are to stone that child to death teenagers here this morning. Be very thankful that we are no longer under the civil law of the Old Testament, okay? Be thankful. Count your blessings. But it could be that the father here is running out to meet the son in order to protect him from being stoned to death. You might say to shield him from the harsh consequences of him sinning and breaking the law. And so keep that tucked away for later. But that's not the end of the story. Let's keep reading verse 21. Almost done. Verse 21, it says, And the son said to him, to the father, it said, Father, I have sinned against heaven, that's before God, and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Great humility here. And as he says that, verse 22, But the father said to his servant, stop right there for a moment. Did you notice how the son never got through with his prepared speech? If you remember back, the son had this long speech prepared that he was going to explain to his father how he's willing to work as a servant, that he's no longer you know, worthy to be called a son. He was going to do this long speech. The, 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 the father stops him mid-speech. Mid he cuts him off and says to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, he says, and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Ha, watch this. And bring the fattened calf. We're having steaks tonight is what he's saying. And kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. What an amazing, amazing story here. Now, real quickly, notice the three gifts that the father presents to the son here. A robe, a ring, and sandals. A robe, a ring, and sandals. First, the father sent for a robe. Not just any robe, the best robe. Who do you think the best robe would have belonged to? The father. He called for his own robe. This is the, the son being clothed in the garments of the father. Secondly, he put a ring on his, on his finger. This would have been the signet ring, which would have been a symbol of authority. It symbolized his full status in the family. He's not going to be a servant. No, no, no. He's going to be a son. But then thirdly, in a similar way, he put sandals on his feet. Listen, servants never wore shoes in the house. Only a son did. And while the son requested the status of a, service, a servant, his request is being denied by the father here. No, no, this son is being restored to a son. But what is all this communicating to us? Listen, this story communicates, in my opinion, one of the sweetest words in our language. In fact, it's one of my favorite words. In fact, it's, it's so loved by me and my wife that we named our first child, this is her middle name, is the word grace. 
grace. That is what this story is communicating. This story communicates amazing grace. Forgiveness. For the son deserved to be punished. The son deserved to be stoned to death according to the law. But the father gives the son not what he deserved, but rather what he didn't deserve. deserve. He showed him grace. And I want you to know that the grace that God offers to us in our sin, listen, it, it, we receive that free of charge. Listen, we don't earn it. In fact, if we could earn God's grace, then it would cease to be grace. We don't earn it. It's free. My, but my friend, please understand this. God's grace is not cheap. Or rather, it came with a cost. Please do not read this story and think that somehow God forgives us by accepting our apology and sort of just kind of turns a blind eye to our sin. Oh yeah, you apologize, you confess, and okay, now I'm going to let you back into the family or now I'm going to completely forgive you. Don't read this story and think that, that with our God and, and us being forgiven, don't think that God just you know, sweeps our sin under the rug. No, 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 no. I want you to know we are forgiven because someone stood in our place and took the punishment for us. We are forgiven because someone died so that we might live. Friend, grace is grace all because of Jesus. And in that, that's what grace stands for. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. You get the position of being a son or daughter of the king because Jesus, God's perfect son, got the condemnation of the rebel. That's how the gospel works. My friend, if you need forgiveness today, can I tell you some good news? Jesus offers it to you freely. He does. You don't have to clean your act up first. He'll accept you just as you are. All you have to do is repent and to take that first step towards Him. And when you take that step towards Him, you know what you'll find? You'll find Him running towards you. Eager, ready to forgive you to protect you from the punishment of the law, which is death, just like the Father protected His Son in the story, to clothe you in the righteousness of Christ, just as the Father clothed His Son in the best robe, and to make you one of His children. My friend, that is how God will respond to you today if you confess your sins and repent and turn to Him. Oh, Brad, you don't know all that I've done. I've done this, and I've done that, and I've done it a time or two. Listen, it doesn't matter what you've done. In fact, Romans 5.20 says, where sin abounds, praise God, grace abounds all the more. I love what Corrie ten Boom once said. She said this, there is no pit of sin so deep where the grace of God is not deeper still. And so as Joel 2.13 tells us, so rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is so gracious and compassionate. Friend, is that what you need to do today? If so, come to Him. Come to Him. Let me pray for us. Father, how thankful we are that You are so gracious and kind and compassionate. Father, for so many of us here this morning, we're so thankful that you are patient with us. For Lord, we are a people who are prone to wander and to drift. Lord, we are a people that at times can be so overcome with the temptations to sin and to follow the fleshly desires of our own hearts. And yet, Lord, you stand ready and eager to forgive when repentance is made. And Lord, you stand ready to forgive not because of the sincerity of our apology, Lord, not because of our desire to turn away from evil and sinful things, but Lord, your forgiveness is because of what the Savior has done. And so, Lord, your forgiveness is not cheap. It's free to us. But Lord, it came with a cost. And that cost was the very life of Jesus. As Jesus died on a cross, serving as our substitute, received the punishment that was meant for us, 
Lord, so that we could be forgiven. But Lord, we recognize three days later, Lord, the grave could not hold him. But he rose again, and in his hands, holding the keys to Hades and death itself. So that all those who would put their faith and trust and hope in Christ, Lord, that we too, even though we may die physically, Lord, we will live forever and ever and ever with you in heaven. Lord, as a church, we have that hope. And our greatest desire is that for those around you who are far from you, Lord, that they would repent, turn to you, and that our hope would be their hope as well. Lord, may you do a great work in their hearts here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, here this morning, um, we, uh, we want to help kind of help you navigate how to maybe to respond to how the, the Lord through His Spirit may be speaking to your heart. And uh, so we were thinking through some ways in which people might want to respond to the Word of God. It's interesting. Every time the Word of God is preached, every time it is taught, it demands a response. Like, it's not good enough to just be like, okay, that's great, and then leave and not ever seek to apply God's Word to your heart. For some of you here this morning who are believers, you're living in right relationship with God, you're committed to Him, you're in right relationship with the church, and all of that, your response this morning is to, to leave and to rejoice and to and to share this good news with others. That may be your response. But for others, maybe here this morning, who, who might feel a little bit more like the prodigal son in our story, maybe your response is a little bit different. And, and if that's you here this morning, I just want to, you'll see this up on the screen here, just maybe four ways. Some of these may apply to you. Some of them don't, may not. That's okay. But for some of you today, you need to respond by, by waving the white flag and surrendering your life to Jesus, maybe for the first time. To say, you know what, I I've, I've maybe was a part of the church, or I've never been a part of the church, but I know what sin is, and I know what judgment is, and I know that if I don't repent and trust in Jesus Christ alone, I'm headed straight towards hell. And so I want to give my life to Christ here this morning. That may be you. And maybe others of you here this morning, maybe you, you trusted in Jesus, but you're not really plugged into a church, and, and you know that you need to lock arms with other believers and to go all in and to be a a full-fledged member of the body of Christ. So what it means to be a member, to actually be connected to the body. Some people say they're connected to a body or a church, but they're not actually a part of that body. It may be member, but you're member in name only. And so maybe this morning your commitment is to say, you know what, no, I, I, I want to be a true member, a faithful member, a committed member to the local church. And maybe you want to talk more about membership. Maybe for others of you, there's something going on in your life and you just, you just need prayer. Like you need somebody to pray for you, to stand in the gap, and just to intercede on your behalf, we'd love to do that. Maybe others of you, you want to talk about what your next steps may be look, looking like. Some of you, you might want to do baptism. Maybe you want to talk about a Bible study coming up, and you want to get to know the church members more, or how you might best serve, or whatever the case may be. But we want to just, again, kind of gently encourage you, whatever that next step may be, to take it. To take that next step. In fact, right after the first service, I had one that came to the back and spoke with me about their need to be baptized. God had been convicting her and convicting her, and so here in the next couple of days, we're going to be talking about when a good day to, it, it will be to, to baptize her and allow her to go public with her testimony of being saved by Jesus and talk more about membership. And so that was her story. What's your story here this morning? What decision do you need to make? Listen, that may be different in some ways, but Listen, all of us need to respond to God's, God's Word. And so if you're here this morning and maybe this is a response you need to take this here on the screen, I want you to know as soon as we start singing here in just a few moments, I'm going to make my way down this aisle. I'm going to be standing in the back with some more pastors. We'd love just to take a few minutes with you. I know many of you got places to go, maybe lunch or whatever. But listen, we'll, we won't take up much of your time. We just want to speak with you, possibly pray for you, answer any questions you may have, and then you'll be on your way. But whatever it is, listen, don't leave here this morning. Don't leave here this morning without making sure that you're right with God, okay? Uh, tomorrow is not guaranteed for you. This afternoon is not guaranteed for you. But you have right now, you have right now to respond to God's Word and God's Spirit. You take advantage of it, okay? Let's stand now. You come meet me in the back if you need me.
Well, that does it for our worship services here this morning. And as always, we'd love a chance to meet you face-to-face if you're able. Uh, if you want to go to our website at understhesteeple.com, you can find out more information about our worship services as well as ministry opportunities to see how you might become a part of what God is doing here at First Baptist Church of Cleveland. Don't forget that tonight at 6 o'clock we have our Through the Bible study where we walk through the entire Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. It's going to be a great time together of studying the Word and of worshiping the Lord. Lord. And so, as always, have a great rest of the week, and God bless you.